Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, and there you have it, uh, our little introduction for today's webinar, and you can see Matt Hogan in picture. Matt is in Illinois and got up very early this morning. We, we don't quite uh, realize it, Matt, when we're sitting on the other side of the world. Although it's noon here in South Africa, it's uh, almost an ungodly hour uh, still for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a little early, uh, 4 a.m. my time. Um, but you know what? I'm an early riser, so here we go. I'm just starting a little earlier today. Matt, before we bring in our uh, conversation with our, uh, with the business community today, um, my colleague, our general manager, Stuart Lohman, likes to take us through the tech to make sure that everybody actually can hear us and uh, that they know how to pose the question. So, Stu, over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Alec, and welcome, Matt. Um, for those new to the webinars, um, there's a little high five option on the control panel on the right hand side. If you can hear my voice and see Matt and Alec on screen, can you give us a few high fives? Uh, there we go. Alec got a few coming through. That's great. Um, as Alec mentioned in the intro, it's, we do like to keep it conversational. There's little questions dropped on on that same control panel. If you can put your question there, Alec can pass it on to Matt as they run through the presentation and talk to us about the US. Alec, uh, all good this side. Thanks. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Stu. Uh, the first time I heard about uh, visas or green cards, Matt, was uh, a, a colleague of mine going back 20 years won a green card in a lottery. I remember uh, Tim Wood, fantastic guy, really uh, highly skilled. He actually uh, was my partner in building MoneyWeb, a company that I started uh, whew, more than 20 years ago. And once he got this, he won the lottery as he uh, for the green card and, and he was off to the United States. He's been very happy there and had a very successful career. Uh, we're gonna talk about the EB-5 visas where you, obviously don't uh, put your ha your uh, your future in the hands of lady luck but is that still is that lottery still going the 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 one that Tim won yeah it is and you know what it's it's just as you would describe it and as you would think it is it's 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 certainly putting your hands uh you know it's 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 giving up your your fate to lady luck it's it's putting your name in the hat with you know millions of people from around the world who want that opportunity to immigrate to the United States. It is still going, I think, uh, during the Trump administration, certainly it faced some scrutiny. And I think there's a lot of people that would like to see you know, immigration amended to a more merit-based uh, system. And, and certainly I think that's the contrast between that type of system and the EB-5 investment, uh, investor visa program. And uh, you know, obviously in EB-5, uh, you, you control your own destiny a little bit better. There's an investment that's made, and and uh, if jobs can be created, you can uh, earn a U.S. green card. So it's a little bit different, obviously, path than than the, the lottery program. Well, that, that's interesting. I guess you would go for the EB-5 because of certainty, because you've made your decision that you really want to live in the United States. If you went for the lottery, you might get it, you might not get it. Uh, there's just as much demand to get into the U.S. today as a, as there ever has been. That, that's exactly right. And like I said, millions of people from around the world every year put their name in the hat for that lottery system. And, you know, very few people actually are successful with it and limited level of certainty there. And the EB-5 visas, just before we get into the detail of, of what it is that you guys are offering, how did they all begin? Where did they, where did they start and, and, and why? Sure. So the EB-5 Investor Visa Program, EB-5 stands for uh, Fifth Preference Employment-Based Visa Category. 
And there are many different visa categories in the United States, some that allow you to you know, move a business into the United States and run that business. There are others that, uh, like the lottery program, you're, you're just simply, uh, you know, it's a luck of the draw type system. There are others that allow you to hold a certain employment position within the United States. Uh, you know, this one is a program that's centered around um, investors bringing in currency into the United States that can be used for economic stimulation and job creation. And if those investors can prove that they've created 10 new jobs, they can become eligible for a green card, not only for themselves, but for their spouse and any unmarried children under the age of 21. So it's also you know, a family immigration category. Um, many people from around the world love this category because again, a uh, higher level of certainty. And then also because of that family, the family side of it, it gives them uh, the opportunity to come to the United States and, and as a permanent resident, mind you. So they can live anywhere, they can work anywhere. Uh, after five years, um, they can then go through the naturalization process to become a U.S. citizen and have voting rights and, um, and carry a U.S. passport. But uh, in many cases, almost most importantly, um, it gives their, their children the opportunity to come to the United States, live in the United States, go to school in the United States. And then rather than looking at other visa programs such as H-1B to stay here and to work in the United States, um, they have the same rights to work anywhere that any U.S. citizen would have. It sounds very American. You, you have the money, you invest it, you are going to be a productive citizen, you bringing, you're making a contribution to society, we want you. <laughs> I guess uh, it's it, very different to many other parts of the world where uh, people are wanting to leave the country rather than entering it. And I suppose that's where the secret lies. If you have this, this magnet uh, for productive people from other parts of the world, they are prepared to actually make the investment to join that society. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, one thing I would add is that, you know, EB-5 is, is one of immigration, one of the, you know, premier, I, I believe the premier immigration by investment programs throughout the world. But many other countries have programs that I would say are, are similar. So you can look at the opportunity to immigrate to other countries. Usually it's by making some sort of you know, purchase either in real estate or some direct investment into their banking system. The unique thing about EB-5, and what's really, what I think is really cool about EB-5 is I think it stands to make a, a larger direct benefit on the United States. So you have motivated people from around the world who wanna to get to the United States, and you have this tool for the US government to create jobs, have foreign investors directly invest into your country, I uh, use that money towards infrastructure projects, construction projects, whatever it might be. And, and you can show and you can, you can measure that, that impact that EB-5 can have. The greatest thing in the world about, about it for the EB-5 investors is not only do they get a green card, but if they select a, a quality regional center that's experienced, that's working with great developers, they can actually get that money back. So it's an investment that they have the opportunity to recover over a period of time. I presume that the level of investment will determine, will be determined by uh, the demand for these EB-5 visas. How's that changed over the over the years? Before we get into uh, your presentation, which we're going to get in in just a moment. Yeah, great, great question. So, you know, the program was originally established back in 1990, and at that point in time, they set the investment threshold at a million U.S. dollars, and that was the, the main investment threshold, but they put a caveat in there in that if you invest into what's called a high unemployment area or a targeted employment area or a rural area, um, that investment level would be reduced to 500,000 US dollars. And for years and years, it stayed at 500,000. Um, but in the original law, they suggested that the uh, government would have the power to index that number for inflation. And uh, in the early years of EB-5, very few people utilized this category. And I think it was just due to an overall lack of knowledge on, on how it could benefit people. Um, you know, there are very few practicing regional centers in the industry in the, you know, through the 90s. We were, we were uh, one of the first EB-5 regional centers ever established, and that was in 1997. So it took you know, a while before it started to gain some traction as a, a viable tool for real estate developers or financiers. 
And you know, it, it's as I mentioned, it stayed at 500,000. Well, just last year, they finally went back and they created some regulatory changes that did a couple of things. They tightened up the areas that will qualify for EB-5 investment dollars, and they did increase that investment threshold. So now the, the new investment thresholds are 1.8 million or 900,000 US dollars if you invest into one of those rural or targeted employment areas. So you've been at it since 1997. My goodness, it's uh, it, you, you've seen a lot of developments and changes over the period, but you presumably also know what works and what doesn't work for investors coming in. That's exactly right. And, you know, I think that's one of the things, and, and, and I'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more in the future, but that's one of the things that sets CMB apart. You know, we have this long established track record dating back to 1997. In fact, we were the second regional center ever established. Uh, and that first regional center is uh, actually had to change its name due to you know, various reasons. And so we've, we've remained relatively, um, you know, the same team, the same, you know, core. Uh, our company was founded by, by Pat Hogan. Pat is actually my uncle. And so we've even developed a bit of a, a family company and we have a legacy that will last years into the future. Um, but, you know, we've been at it for a while and, you know, our, our core concepts and what's, you know, kind of allowed us to be successful, we've never deviated from. We've stayed the same. We've put the same sort of projects together, uh, the same investment structure. And I think it's, it's been great for our company. It's been even better for our investors. It gives them a sense of uh, stability from the start. Well, and there on the screen, we can see your um, vital statistics, as it were. Uh, lots of people, uh, billions of dollars that you brought in. So I guess the government must like you as well. And Pat, your uncle is in front of you in the picture. Is that right? Yeah, he is. He's right in front of me in the picture. So um, that's our, our management team. So what's great about our management team is, you know, we've been intact for quite some time. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Pat has, has, uh, has started the company back in 1997, and uh, he's been at it, been an integral part. He's our CEO. His daughter standing next to him is Noreen Hogan. She's the president of our company now, um, tremendous leader for our company. And then, you know, the rest of the makeup of our team, most of which have over 10 years of experience. Myself, I'm in my 10th year at CMB. And, uh, you know, that in addition to the rest of the you know, fantastic staff that we have, is the core of our company is, is really what makes us special and this is what you focus on matt you do anything else apart from uh, these visas yeah so our core team cmb this is this is our our every day this is what we do so um you know in the last couple of years we've looked at other investment platforms that we've been able to offer to our investors but at its core cmb is always our eb5 is always going to be the heartbeat of our company uh, it's what what takes up the most of our time and, and for good reason, I think it's it's what we're best at. And you can see the stats over uh, on the left-hand side. We're very proud of those. We've worked with over 5,700 clients from around the world. Um, you know, and, and it's not just the fact that you sign a client, it's what can you do for that client after you sign them up? What services can you provide to them? What level of success can you create for them? That's what sets the tone for our company. Let's go through the presentation now. I, I, I like this picture. Uh, and you did send the presentation to us earlier and I had a look at it. Um, are there stories there to those two young ladies, for instance, with a US passport and, and the guy at the bottom with his American flag? There are, there are, there, there, you know, and that's, you hit on something that that's really important. Um, and every one of our investors is unique. Every one of our investors has a story of their own, you know, we have investors from over a hundred different countries. So we have a very diverse array of people that we've been able to provide this service to. Uh, the two young ladies at the top of the screen are, are actually from the UK. Uh, their parents made the investment uh, to bring their family to the United States. They relocated to California. They were able to open a pub. And uh, you know they actually, they did it by uh, selling soccer shops that they owned in the UK, pooled their money, and brought their family to the United States for you know, various reasons and an array of opportunities that they knew that they could provide to them in the future. And then also I think it helps that when you move to sunny Southern California, uh, you, you end up in a place where the sun shines a little bit more than it does in the UK. And <laughs> what I so like cool. about that story, what I like about that story is that, you know, some of our investors are, are 
um, very affluent, high net worth individuals uh, from different parts of the world that are looking at opportunities for their families or they're looking at a, an opportunity for you know, a path to a US citizenship or what have you. And the EP5 investment capital is a relatively small amount to them. And then in other cases, you know, it's a significant investment for some of the families. It means that they're selling a business or they're selling their, their home and they're, they're, they're really you know, aggregating everything that they have to make this investment and move to the United States. You know, and whether it's the high net worth individual who you know, could care less about the investment amount or whether it's someone who's scraping together their last penny, you know, we, we value those, those clients and we do everything we can to take care of those clients and provide them the highest level of service we possibly can. And, and we take it to heart. We, we think it's very important. Their goals and, and meeting their goals are first and foremost to us. American dream. Um, this uh, uh, slide that we have on the screen now shows quite a big network, 50 plus staff members. Do they all again focus on EB5? They do. Every single one of the, the staff members that we have focus on EB5 day in, day out. And, you know, not only, you know, in addition to our management team that I discussed, you know, we have an unbelievable team of investor relations staff from various parts of the world. In-house, you can see we have 15 different languages. And then we also have a sister company that's based in Switzerland that has on-the-ground staff in China, in Turkey, in, um, you know, Vietnam, in, in Korea, in, you know, all over the place. And our team that's in office, whether it be our Illinois office or our Dallas, Texas office, uh, they travel. Obviously, COVID has changed that, so we're doing a bit more webinars than we have in the past, but we're on the ground in our markets. We like to be able to come out, meet people face-to-face, -face, and we welcome people to visit our, our office. Um, in addition to our staff members that, that, speak directly in, uh, that speak directly to our clients, you know, we have uh, a finance team that underwrites our projects, uh, we have a marketing team that puts all of our, our, our uh, presentation materials together that, that gets out and interacts with our, our uh, marketing relationships from around the world. We have an in-house accounting team. We have, you know, as part of our, our project development team, we have construction compliance team. So when you make an investment, we use that capital to fund an ongoing construction project. We have a team that their whole job is to every day to look at these projects, make sure that they're operating the way they're supposed to and provide information back uh, to our, our investor staff, our, our investor relations team, and to our investors. So uh, we have a diverse array of people that, that is really the heartbeat of our company. You know, it's something that's, that's quite relevant uh, for us here in South Africa, but not one that is always appreciated, is that when you have global companies, they also have global standards. So you, whether you're dealing uh, in Korea, China, uh, India, Vietnam, as you've got it there, South America, you've got to be You've got to be world class. You've got to be operating at a certain level. Um, whereas quite often we see people coming into South Africa uh, taking advantage of the, the relative ignorance, I would say, of, uh, of, of countries like ours that have been isolated or geographically uh, far away from the rest of the world for a while. So that is something that, that is interesting. It, you haven't structured your business just to come to South Africa. When did you decide, though, to to start including this country in the global network? Well, actually, we've been active in South Africa for quite some time. Um, we've been visiting South Africa for probably four or five years now uh, on a regular basis. A couple of different members of our staff have, have made that trip and have uh, been able to kind of serve as the face of South Africa. Uh, Kai Boyle, our, our, one of our vice presidents, and then also Kyle Kamen, you have him, he's pictured here as, as US-based, but uh, he spent a lot of time actually in South Africa um, interface, interfacing with clients. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I think, and it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it, that is an all too uh, prevalent issue, I would say, in EB-5. People that, um, you know, focus almost primarily on certain markets. You know, you can see down here, we have 102 investors from 102 different countries. And so we cast a very wide net. We spread out around the world. And we advertise in different markets. We visit these markets regularly. South Africa is one of those markets. You know, certainly uh, throughout the years in EB5, there's been huge demand from countries like China and it shifted Vietnam and India, I think usually have made up the top three. And so a lot of regional centers almost exclusively marketed in those, those, those countries. What's unique is that you also have other regional centers that were very new to EB5 that didn't have a track record. 
that didn't have an established uh, presence in any market. And so they looked at places that could become new and emerging markets, and then they set up shop in places like South Africa. And so there actually are regional centers that have been active in South Africa that, you know, probably unfortunately uh, to the clients that are interested in EB5 from South Africa, um, you know, they've been availed to sometimes regional centers that maybe aren't as established that are looking to kind of get a foothold in a market that, as you mentioned, uh, may be new to EB5. And I think in those situations, they have taken advantage of kind of the, the naivete or the lack of knowledge on how the process works or what they should be looking for in an established EB5 regional center. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate to, to work with a number of South African clients over the years, bring them success at all levels. And, um, you know, something we take a lot of pride in. I prefer your description, naivete rather than ignorance. Okay, so here's the overview. Perhaps you can talk us through exactly what EB-5 is. Yeah, and we touched on it before. So EB-5 was established back in, in 1990. It's the uh, immigration by investment vehicle for the U.S. As I mentioned, many other countries have programs similar to EB-5, but EB-5 has some unique features to it in that uh, it's, it's, in the U.S., a job creation program, and it's an economic stimulization tool. And for the obviously for the foreign national, it's a path to immigrating to the United States on a permanent basis. And so, uh, other programs from around the world maybe give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, almost purchase citizenship or, you know, purchase a piece of real estate that then can turn into the opportunity for permanent residency. EB5, you know, creates a, you know a situation that I think is mutually beneficial for the country, and the the investor themselves creates jobs in the U.S. And it gives the the foreign national that path to permanent residency that can turn into citizenship if the investor chooses it to. Uh, right now, the the minimum investment threshold is nine hundred thousand. You know, we'll primarily focus on projects that do qualify and meet that minimum investment threshold. So right now, we actually have two opportunities available at the nine hundred thousand dollar investment level. And then, you know, as I mentioned, the program is really geared towards job creation in the U.S. So these are primarily construction projects. Um, they span many different industry sectors. Right now, we're focused heavily on, on logistics because it's a booming area of growth in the United States and, and internationally. And I think it's a great, um, there's great synergy there for, for us to be able to create a safe, risk mitigated EP5 investment opportunity that can create those jobs and give the investors the highest likelihood of getting their green cards and getting their money back. Mm -hmm. And I see there's 10,000 green cards per annum for the EB-5 investors. Are they all used up every year? They are. Well, in the early years, no. But since about uh, 2014, yes. So EB-5 grew steadily in demand over the years, and it really it, it reached its peak in probably 2015, 2016. And so now, every year, all 10,000 of those green cards are consumed. Uh, one of the things that's nice for South Africa is that uh, although the majority of those green cards are consumed by countries like China, every country is given the ability to earn 700 green cards, or I'm sorry, 700 visas uh, each year. So the first 700 go to you know countries that consume those, and then the balance that's left over gets consumed by people who exceed that 700 mark. So China exceeds that 700 mark, Vietnam and India do. Uh, almost every other country in the world, it's unlikely that they, they'll reach that mark where they actually start consuming more than 700 visas. So why that's important for a South African client is that you're not likely going to be in line behind a Chinese investor. Each year uh, when those 700 visas become available, the likelihood is, is that you're going to have the ability to earn one of those 700 green cards and you wouldn't end up in some sort of a backlog situation. So the, the barrier is $900,000. Uh, there are 700 of those cards available for South Africa. And uh, well, if there were to be a, a rush, uh, presumably South Africa would also then, over the 700, have to join the queue behind people elsewhere in the world. But that does give you quite a high degree of comfort. Uh, let's talk about uh, this slide that you have on the screen there. We all know Amazon in South Africa. We also know General Electric. So it looks like the buildings that you are investing investors' money into uh, are in, in pretty safe uh, rental hands. 
Yeah, and you know, this is something that we take a lot of pride in. So, on uh, one of the previous side slides, I think we were able to show, you know, we've 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 put out over 70 EB5 investment partnerships, and they do span many different industry sectors. But we're very conscious of the industry sectors that we take on. And right now, with the uncertainties in in the the markets across many different asset types, you know, we really are trying to tighten up our focus and look at at areas of growth. And logistics is one of those areas of growth. And Hillwood, the developer that we work with primarily on our industrial logistics uh, projects, has been an unbelievable relationship for CMB. Hillwood is a, a uh, one of the top developers in the U.S. They're actually the development arm of the Perot family. They were established by Ross Perot. Uh, many, okay. many may know him. Ran for president twice back in the uh, 1990s, 1992, and in 1996. And his son, Ross Pro Jr., is the chairman of that company. It was founded uh, back in 1988, and they are absolutely a leader in the development of industrial logistics projects. Uh, for as as you as you're noting, companies like Amazon. I think we've now done, I believe, eight or nine projects that are, are now home to Amazon fulfillment centers. And you know, the list of Fortune 500 companies goes on and on. GE being one of them. Um, you know, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola. There's so many of these 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 projects that they've been able to develop. They have unbelievable banking relationships, unbelievable relationships with tenants, and a lot of the projects they do, and both projects that we're featuring right now, are build to suit, meaning they've already lined up that tenant. They're they're building a project specific to the needs of that tenant, and to us, that creates one of the best EB5 investment projects you can possibly have, because not only do you know that the building's going to get built. But you know that you're going to have a tenant that is, is trustworthy, that's going to guarantee those lease revenues, and they're all long-term leases. So the likelihood of you having a, an asset of value that can be sold or recapitalized and allow for the repayment of EB-5 capital is very good. Um, this next slide is, is a bit of info, background info on, on Hillwood. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just before we move on to the next one, Ross Perot is also EDS, isn't he? That's a company well-known here in South Africa. He is, he is. Very unique, unique guy and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, he, he got a start at IBM and it's a, it's a funny story. What happened is, is he, he was a salesman for IBM, reached his quota uh, on how many units he could sell, you know, very early on and went to the CEO directly and said, hey, I've got some other ideas. Uh, you know, uh, What do you think about getting into the software business? And they said, well, that's not really for us. And so eventually he left uh, IBM and, and formed companies like EDS, like Pro Data Systems. Uh, Pro Data, I believe EDS ended up uh, um, uh, transitioning or selling to GE. Pro Data Systems sold to Dell. It was really a pioneer in the software field. and. Uh, um, you know, transition that into many different businesses that uh, that he took on, and Hillwood being one of them. Great pedigree. Okay, let's talk about the projects, shall we? Sure. So, as I mentioned, both of the projects we're featuring are logistics buildings, build to suit logistics buildings for uh, uh, Fortune 500 tenants. Uh, the tenants, uh, if you if you want more information on those, you can contact. CMB, after we sign a non-disclosure, we can give you a lot of information on those tenants. Uh, unfortunately, we're bound by certain confidentiality restrictions, so I can't share them with you, but I think you know many people can probably also make some assumptions on the companies that are, are leading in growth right now and, and that we've worked with many times in the past. But uh, this first one, Group 75, uh, we're building a, a logistics center for a, a top 10 uh, Fortune 500 company that is a leader in logistics around the world. It's $26.1 million raise, so we're going to subscribe 29 EB-5 investment units. We already do have investors who have signed up for the partnership, and so it's it's currently ongoing. Okay. Uh, business Park 275? That's right. So it's Group 75, and it's Commerce Business Park 275. That's that's the project. It's it's a, uh, as you can see, a 517,000 square foot logistics facility. This is actually going to be built outside of Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, um, as some people may know, uh, has has really kind of gone through, you know, a renaissance over the years. Um, you know, after the financial crisis in 2008, uh, 
the, the industries there took a major blow. The auto industry was obviously the major driver for job creation in that market, and it's been slow to recover. Now, I think you're seeing a lot of companies make huge investments into Detroit, uh, and especially from a logistics standpoint. Great proximity to the, this one will have great proximity to the airport. Um, when you think of Detroit, it's also across the river from, from Canada. And so you have a great entry point there for uh, you know, foreign trade and international goods that come in through Canada. And it, it, it can you know, serve as a fantastic distribution hub for the upper Midwest. And uh, the completion targeted for the third quarter 2021, I see there, does that mean yeah. that you're in the process now of raising money as part of this EB-5 program and, and the returns, when do they kick in? Yeah, absolutely. So we are currently in the process of raising capital for the project. And, you know, when you think about EB-5, you think about job creation. And so what's important to an EB-5 investor? Well, obviously, they have to be able to show the government that jobs took place so that they can earn their green card. When you already have a project that's underway, it's fully capitalized, uh, all the pieces of the puzzle are in place, the development is ongoing, it's fully entitled. Uh, as I mentioned, they have a lease tenant that's that's already been signed, uh, or I'm sorry, that's in the process of being signed that they're already working with on the early phase work. And uh, and the project is is set, as, a, as you're seeing here, set to be completed in July of next year. So you know that that job creation phase you know, you can check that box, that that's already ongoing. Likelihood of it being completed is very good. And when we look at these projects, another unique feature is, is that in most situations, Hillwood is a build and sell model. And so very quickly, they're going to build those projects. They're going to have a very brief lease stabilization period. And then they're going to be looking to shop this project because it would be pre-leased, 15-year lease with a strong tenant. They're going to be looking to shop it to a real estate investment trust, or you know a, a retirement fund who's going to hold that project for the long-term revenue stream, and so you're going to see a very quick turnaround. I believe this one has uh, an anticipated exit sometime in 2022, which means for an EB-5 investor, not only are you going to see job creation be met quickly, you're going to see the potential for uh, repayment to occur very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that uh, brings us on to the next the second of the projects that you wanted to talk about. That's right. So uh, our next opportunity is CMB Group 78. And another one, working with Hillwood, building logistics developments. Uh, the first projects were in, were in Michigan. These two are in Southern California. And so what we've done in this partnership is we've combined two similar projects. This is something very common that we've done with Hillwood over the years. Uh, when they have two projects on similar timelines, it creates an opportunity for us to raise EB-5 investment capital that can be used for, for both of these, these projects. And so this is a little bit larger raise. We had the, the ability to raise up to 81 units. Uh, we already do have investors who have signed up for this project as well. And so we're going to continue to raise on this one. And I would tell you, one thing I would tell you, and, and both with 75 and with Group 78, um, we're going to be steadily raising investors through the end of this year. And I would tell you into the first half of next year as well for both these partnerships. So if you're interested, if you're if you're um, kind of just getting started in EB-5, I think you'll have the opportunity to join one of these two partnerships uh, over the next several months. And um, you know certainly projects like these are, are relatively high demand, and so we'll work with you on you know getting through your process, understanding these documents, understanding the the, the projects themselves. Um, we'll help you through that entire process. But I do think that you'll have some time to get into these opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a little bit more information on, on the projects that are within this Group 78 partnership. So the first project you're seeing here is called Waterman TI, and this is going to focus primarily on tenant improvements, so tenant build-outs at this, this project. So one of the unique features about this opportunity is that uh, this building was already is already completed, so it's already completed, and the work to build out the entire interior of the infrastructure is the focus of this investment partnership. Why I like this, and what, what's really cool about this, is that this is already pre-leased. That uh -huh. the tenant is an, is a top ten Fortune 500 company, major logistics developer. Uh, um, I'm sorry, logistics operator, internationally known, as I've mentioned. Uh, we can give you, again, much more information. 
after you've signed an NDA. And, and I think it's important that people understand, you know, the confidentiality side of it is important, just as if you were going to invest with CMB, you know, the confidentiality side of you, you know, your concerns are, are important to us as well. And so um, we take those things very seriously. And so with this particular tenant, They've actually signed a long-term lease agreement, and under that lease agreement, they have work that uh, needs to be completed on this building. When the building was originally built out, it was built on spec, meaning they didn't have a tenant lined up, and they were going to go out and market the project for, uh, you know, an end user. They've now signed that end user, and so Hillwood, under the lease agreement, as I mentioned, has the requirement to build out a significant amount of improvements to meet the needs of that tenant. And what's more that tenant has fully guaranteed the repayment of any build out uh, that takes place inside that. And it's a feature under the lease agreement. So as soon as the work is completed, it's substantially completed and inspected, the, the tenant is obligated to then go in and reimburse Hillwood in full for that work that's been completed. And a pledge of the reinvestment under that construction contract is actually what secures this project. So not only do you have a project that uh, is is being built out and is, is nearly substantially complete, will be completed later this month. Um, but it's secured effectively uh, by a guarantee of repayment under that lease agreement from a top 10 Fortune 500 company. Uh, it creates a really unique, really uh, um, fantastic opportunity, very risk mitigated opportunity for EB5. And the last of our slides, we've got a few questions. And just to remind you that uh, there's a little question mark on uh, the widget on your screen from GoToWebinar. Click on the question mark and uh, write down your question. I'll make sure that we keep it anonymous. I'll only use your first name uh, when we ask the questions. I know some people also, as you were saying earlier, Matt, about the confidentiality, they prefer not to have their full names uh, disclosed. So. I'll only, I'll, I will pose a question with your name, but only with your first name. So if you'd like to go ahead and type them in, uh, Matt will be here with us, obviously, for the next 15 minutes or so to answer those questions. Do you want to talk to this slide to end the presentation part? Yeah, and I think this is a, a, a great place to end, too. So this is the second opportunity um, or the second uh, uh, project that's, that's part of our Group 78 offering. And what's unique about this one, what I think is, is special about this one is that it's a another build-to-suit logistics development, this one for a, a top 40 Fortune 500 company. Uh, Hillwood is currently uh, in negotiations with that tenant to complete the lease, and then they'll start construction on the building in uh, likely in December. Um, what's unique about this one is it's being built on land that is part of the March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. Why do I think that that's cool? Well. CMB as an acronym actually stands for California Military Base or, or Closed Military Base as we sometimes refer to it. it. This project really takes us back to our roots. When we started in EB-5 back in the late 90s, we focused on the redevelopment of former uh, military bases. If you think of you know, the US kind of industri um, military industrial complex, we built out an unbelievable amount of uh, military bases, Air Force bases, Naval bases, uh, especially on the West Coast where we were concerned of you know, various threats after World War II. And over the years, a lot of those bases have been decommissioned or have they've been closed or restructured. And in our earliest days, what our focus was is, is taking those closed military bases, uh, providing EB-5 investment capital to do new infrastructure, put in new roads, new sewer systems, uh, new utilities, and then start to build the, 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 the uh, pads and platforms for projects such as these. And uh, March Air Force Base, was one of the regions that we were originally designated to work in. And it, 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 uh, it took us several years, but this is actually the first opportunity that we'll take on at March. And so this will be a uh, you know very large, 2 million square foot industrial logistics building, build a suit for a top 40 Fortune 500 tenant uh, on land that is part of the, the March Air Force Base that is, is, uh, is gonna be uh, leased to this developer uh, for the development of this project. So another great, opportunity within uh, group 78. I love the little history that you gave us about uh, where the CMB name comes from because uh, often when one has uh, alphabetical characters it's it's to do with people's surnames uh, but in your case a California military basis. 
Interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from Gideon. He wants to know, apart from the money invested, so that's, I guess, the $900,000, are there any other vetting processes before being granted the EB-5? So any other vetting processes? So, you know, a couple of things. So when you start this process, first and foremost, we would want you to work with an immigration attorney. You know, there are, and this is important, there are a lot of regional centers out there that will say, hey, we have an immigration attorney. We want you to work with my immigration attorney. They know us, they know our projects, they know how we work. You know, we, we put it in your hands. We want you to choose who you're most comfortable with. We want you to vet the attorneys that, that you're gonna consider because you know, we're gonna be an advocate for you on your EB-5 investment. Um, we're gonna pool your capital, make a loan to a developer, and we're gonna fight for you along the way to make sure the job creation takes place and your money comes back but you also need an advocate on your immigration side. And we don't want that you know, to be conflicted with our efforts. So we, we want you to have someone that you're truly comfortable with. Um, we certainly have worked with many, many immigration attorneys over the years. So we can provide various recommendations for you to consider. But from a vetting standpoint, we'd want you to vet your attorney. We'd wanna make sure that you have someone that you trust and, and can be an advocate for you. We'd also want you to make sure that you have qualified tax people you know, that can provide you advice specific to your own needs. We can also recommend people from that regard as well, but I think that's an important part of your process. Um, and then, you know, if you're if you're talking about pooling capital from South Africa or various other countries to make this investment, you might also want to work with, you know, uh, an accountant or a, a CPA or a chartered accountant that can help you throughout that process and make sure that everything that you're doing uh, meets the the requirements of the EB-5 program. So, in other words, you can uh, look after the 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 investment itself, that's your uh, speciality, but you can also recommend uh, an accountant and an immigration lawyer uh, that uh, the the investor can engage with directly and maybe Absolutely. maybe re recommend a few and they can decide which one to go with. Absolutely, and Di do we think that that's the way to go? Diane asks, she says, from the time you invest your money with CMB, how long before you can enter the US with your family? Sure, so great question. So right now those times vary. Um, the USCIS posts processing times on their website and I think uh, they can sometimes be uh, an area of concern or confusion to EB-5 investors and there's some nuance to the processing times that they post. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, you know, over the years the processing times for that first immigration petition, your I-526 petition, uh, has, has grown in length. And in the earliest days of EB-5, it would get processed in a matter of maybe a couple of months. Um, now, the posted processing times say that it could take up to four years for your petition to be approved. What I would tell you is, is that very recently, we've seen processing times come back in as early as 15 months. Our Group 63 partnership just received an approval and it took about 15 months. Now, I wouldn't tell you that that's the, the standard rule that every investor should get a petition approval in about a year. Um, but what I would tell you is, is I think that we're seeing, and I think the industry is seeing, processing times start to speed up. And when you look at those posted processing times of four years, how they describe that is that 50% of all petitions are approved prior to that point. And then they usually post a, a longer processing time. I'm not sure what it is right now. It's probably, it could be six years. But then they'll say 90% of all petitions are processed before that period of time. One other thing that's important to note is part of what's driven those processing times up is the influx of petitions that we saw in, in various points in time throughout the EB-5 program. In 2015, we saw a massive rush. In 2016, we saw another massive rush. And it was primarily driven by concern that that price was gonna go up. Well, now that price did go up. And so I think the number of petitions that they're seeing filed is, is decreasing. And so they have less petitions on file. So the likelihood that they're gonna you know, speed up processing times is good. And then in March of last year, they also changed their processing uh, um, uh, policy. In the past, it was always first come, first serve. So if you'd have a huge mountain of petitions uh, from a country like China, they'd just go through first in, first out, and, and process those. Well now, because there's such a visa backlog in countries like China or India or Vietnam, they're actually pushing those petitions to the side and they're processing petitions from countries where visas are readily available for the clients, South Africa obviously being one of those because it does not exceed 
that 700 visa count in any, in any calendar year. And so uh, I think that's also gonna improve the likelihood that you'll see an earlier process, processed petition. And so why I, I have all that talk about processing times, it, it's part and parcel to her question. When will it be before I'm able to enter the country? Well, the first thing is, is you have to receive the, the approval of your I-526 petition. And then there's usually about a six month or so point in time in which you'd then go file for your consular interview and have the ability to earn your, or receive your visa that allows you to enter the country. So I think over the last couple of years, it'd be safe to say that in most cases, that, that time is taking around maybe two or three years for most people. So that's, that's I think, would be a pretty conservative estimate. So it's a long-term decision. You take the decision today, you start talking to uh, CMB, you begin the process with your immigration lawyer and your accountant, and you know that you'll be getting on a plane with your family probably only in two years time. Somewhere around there, yeah. And you know, you hit on something that's important. It, it is a long-term decision. And um, you know, when people make that decision to use EB-5, they're, they're using the EB-5 program to create a, a level of certainty on whether or not they'll be able to use this to enter the country and to be able to remain there permanently. Well, if you're thinking about you know, being there permanently, then that time period, is, it's truly worth the wait. And you know, we have concerns pop up all the time about, you know, and questions pop up all the time about how long that process takes. And one thing I would caution every investor with is that the answer that I gave you, um, you know, is, is from our experience and is based on, on fact. You know, we, we, we watch these day in, day out. We have over 5,700 clients that we've worked with. You're going to hear other regional centers tell you, oh, well, with me, it only takes seven months. With me, it only takes 12 months. You know, I promise you that all of my petitions are getting approved in 13 months or 15 months, whatever it might be. You're going to hear nonsensical commentary on how long other regional centers think that it's going to take you. Um, I'd rather prepare you with honest and, and forthright information so that you can plan because again, this is for many people, you know, a family plan, it's, it's something for their future. It's something to, to prepare them for a new life in the US. And I wouldn't want to give you false hopes on a, an earlier processing time. So I'd want to give you real transparent information that I can support from our information and our data. And I would tell you that there are other regional centers out there that, that will give you a little bit different answer. And so you really need to, to question uh, misinformation that can be out there. Graham asks, he says, does an applicant need to be employed in the relevant project? And does the investor need to live near to the project? Two great questions. Uh, no and no. So, uh, you know, the EB-5 program, one of the great things about EB-5 is it creates a relatively passive or investment in immigration route. Um, I say relatively passive because the program does require that you do have some uh, management in, in the project itself, and that's given uh, through our documents through the rights to vote in various situations. But for the most part, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for the most part, you know, you're making an investment into an offering that's pooling investor capital and making a loan. We're monitoring that loan, enforcing the terms of the loan agreement, aggregating uh, employment data. And once you've entered the United States, you can work anywhere, you can live anywhere. Once you have that conditional green card, you're actually treated like you know any other US citizen, only difference being you don't have the right to vote, you don't carry a US passport, you're just a permanent resident. But so no, you don't have to be employed by the project. And then the second question, this is one of the most common questions we get, you know, do I have to live in the area where the project is located? Absolutely not. This is one of the greatest things about EB-5. You know, you can look at a project that that's located in an area that, that uh, fits the threshold for lower investment amount, that is in a market that is, is uh, you know, a, a perfect uh, climate for the investment that you're, you're seeking, but you can live anywhere. You can make that investment in Detroit, Michigan and live in Miami, Florida if you want. And the point here is that it's a loan. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. You're not making an investment which will then be determined by the return that the project uh, achieves. It's more that your 
repayments are going to be met by the partner who's doing the project. So when you yeah. when you uh, operating with a, a Perot company, a Perot Group company, that gives you uh, quite a lot of confidence that they w it is a business that's in the uh, in the point of being able to um, meet the interest re uh, repayments and certainly the capital repayments when that loan comes to an end. Yeah, and that's you know, that's a great point. The investment that you make, you're investing into a partnership that's pooling capital and making a loan. So your investment into that partnership is is an equity investment. <coughs> Excuse me. Is an equity investment. But when the the money actually is provided to the borrower that's using that capital for you know some job creating project, it is a loan. And that's a, a model that we pioneered all the way back in 1997. CMB was the first to use the loan model, and now it's actually become, you know, probably standard throughout the entire EB-5 industry. I would tell you 75 plus percent of all EB-5 investments that we see today and, and truly over the last, you know, six or seven years have been loan models, just like what CMB originally pioneered. And so, again, as you noted, if we're finding a great developer, one with a great track record of being able to complete their projects on time and on budget, service their debt and repay their loans, you know, we reduce some of the risks that that partnership won't see the return of that loan capital. And obviously once that loan capital is returned, that money can be made available to uh, repay the investments of the individual EB-5 limited partner. So not only do you get your green card, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. uh, Paige? asks for an individual to qualify he she required to relocate to the us yes so and there's some nuance to this also so it's a good question so a lot of times we'll work with people who run a business and so you may own and run a business in in south africa and you really don't have intention of selling your business or you know relocating your business to the united states but you'd like the opportunity to utilize eb5 maybe for your family and so a uh, couple of things. So once you uh, receive your conditional green card, you need to establish residency in the United States and the primary applicant. So if you are the owner of the company yourself and you need to stay in South Africa, you could have your spouse be the primary applicant and that primary applicant would need to stay in the United States and rule of thumb there is, is, is a little bit more than six months a year during that two year period of conditional residency. So for that two year period, you'd have to stay, the primary applicant would have to stay in the US for, for about six months a year in order to maintain their residency position that uh, is a requirement of the program. Now, the person who's you know the spouse and maybe the owner of the business, they can still kind of come and go freely, stay in South Africa to run the business, and they may never actually need to you know, fully establish residency in the United States. We see this, it's very common where you'll have a husband or a wife uh, serve as that primary applicant. They'll relocate to the United States for that two-year period with the children. Maybe the children will start school or, or maybe the husband or wife that relocates will maybe start a new business there. But uh, the spouse that remained in the home country will continue to run their business. And then once conditional residency is over and once they have their permanent green card, like that two-year period is, is, is come and gone, uh, then it gives that that person who stayed in the home country the ability to just come and go freely as they please. They can continue to remain in the home country and operate their business. And, and what we see is a lot of times, maybe over the years, they'll wind down operations and will eventually move to the United States on a more full-time basis. Mm. Nice uh, detail. Thank you. Andre says, is there an age restriction in investing for an EB-5? There is not. No, there is no age restriction. And so that's another uh, uh, great feature of the program. And the last question that we have, because we are coming to the end of our, our uh, hour, is from Dineshri. And uh, she asks, when do you get your investment back or the payment? When is the payment made back to you? Yes, great question. So uh, the EB-5 program establishes certain rules. So the EB-5 investor needs to remain fully invested in their partnership while they go through that two-year conditional residency period that I mentioned. And so if you make your investment, typically when we pool capital, we make our loans, our loans are six-year loans. And so at the end of that six years, borrower repays the capital and we look at our partnership to see all the investors who have made it through that two-year period. 
in the case of a South African client, likelihood is, is that they're going to have made it through that two-year conditional residency period. So they're going to receive that first approval, relocate to the United States, remain in the United States for two years. That time might take, you know, somewhere between four and six years. But at the point in time in which that loan is repaid at the end of that six-year term, likelihood is, is that they're going to be eligible for return of capital from the USCIS standards. And as soon as our loan is repaid, we return capital to those eligible limited partners. So I would tell you in the case of a South African client, approximately six years uh, start to finish in terms of when they'll be able to receive their capital back. Matt, is there any interest that is paid to those clients? There is. There is a small rate of return that's paid. And one thing I would tell you is, is that this is also something that varies wildly throughout the EB-5 industry. The more uh, established EB-5 regional centers, the groups that, uh, you know, that uh, have been doing this for a long period of time, the rate of returns are, are typically low. And that's for the, the obvious reasons. The EB-5 Regional Center program is, is not your traditional business investment. What we're looking for is risk mitigated projects um, that, uh, that, that are gonna create the jobs necessary and that are gonna allow for the repayment of capital. So we don't wanna put a significant debt load or debt burden on the projects themselves. And the rate of return is usually a little less than 1%. And that's what ours is. Ours is about 0.8% to the individual investor paid out uh, annually. And, you know, that's that's something, as I mentioned, that varies wildly. I think lesser regional centers or less experienced regional centers uh, from a marketing standpoint, because they don't have the long track record, they don't have the established history. And then often they're taking on projects that might be a little bit riskier. Um, they're offering a higher rate of return to those clients. Sometimes you see it maybe three, four or five percent rate of return. So it's never going to blow you away. It's never going to look like, you know, some unbelievable business investment. And what we always tell the people is, is that, you know, if, if you want a, a traditional business investment, there are many other platforms that you can do, you can use for that. Um, but if you want a green card, come to CMB because we're going to focus on the projects that will get the jobs created, that will get you your green card, and that will get you your money back. Just uh, before we close off, let's say you do invest in one of those higher risk projects because you like the idea of a 5% return and it's not successful. What happens to your application then? That's that's a great question. And and so that kind of get into the gets into the ways in which an EB-5 investment can fail. And so you can have a project that gets built, all the jobs get created, and you're able to get your green card, but because of various economic factors or, you know, unfortunately what we see in EB-5 is you know, many times it's an ill-fated project. It's a poorly structured project or something that was, you know, substantially risky uh, that the investor, you know, saw an opportunity to invest in, was attracted by these high rates of return, and the project failed from a business perspective. So you can have a situation where it's successful from an immigration standpoint, meaning it creates the jobs, you get your green card, but you lose your entire investment capital. You can also Ooh. have a, you, yeah, that's, and, and that's a bad situation. So some people might say, okay, well, at least I have the green card. You know, in, in our experience, people aren't okay with just their green card. You know, people want their green card and they want their money back. And so that's what we try and offer to our clients. The other ways in which you can fail, you can have a project, and we talk about those high rate of return projects, you can have a project that, um, you know, it gets built, but maybe they cut some corners during construction. Uh, maybe they reduce their labor force because they're looking at profit margins rather than job creation. And you can have a situation where the project underperforms and does not create or maintain all the jobs that they need to in order for the EB-5 investors to be successful. You can have a situation where the job creation measures aren't met. And remember, in EB-5, if job creation isn't met, it means immediate deportation. That wow. is your ultimate failure. So if those job creation numbers aren't met, you, you lose your immigration benefit and you're, you're put in immediate deportation proceedings. But on the business side, because maybe a savvy developer cut some corners, they reduce their labor force, it could be a booming success where they're able to return, you know, actually pay out that 5% rate of return or maybe something greater than that on an equity type investment. Um, but then you have to look at it and say, you know, what was the point of doing this in the first place? My whole goal was, you know, getting my green card and being able to remain in the U.S. So, to me, that is the ultimate failure in EB-5. And then, of course, 
you know, the worst of all situations is that they don't meet the green cards, you know, they don't meet the job creation necessary for the green cards, and they don't achieve uh, the economic uh, success that they were hopeful of. It's, in most cases, that's that's because they, you know, had some uh, significant design flaws in the way they structured the project from the very beginning, both from an EB-5 perspective and from a business perspective. And uh, in a situation like that, you could lose your immigration benefit and lose your investment capital. And so, you know, ultimate success, what I would tell you, and you know, think back to the slide that we showed earlier, it's goals of the EB-5 investor, and they're in that order for a reason. Number one, your number one goal in EB-5 is always going to be to get your green card. Your second most important goal, and it's a very close second, is to get your, your, your job, or I'm sorry, your, uh, your investment capital back to you. It's, you know, so it's the preservation of that capital. And then the third most important goal, and I always say it should be a, you know, very low on that list. It should be a, a distant third. It should be the return on investment because this isn't, you know, this isn't uh, the investment that's going to build your retirement fund. This isn't the investment that's going to, you know, allow you to, to kind of look at new uh, business horizons. This is, this is the type of risk mitigated project that is going to allow you to enter the United States and stay in the United States and get that capital back if everything goes well. Matt, it's really been good talking with you. Uh, nice, good, straight, honest uh, talking, exposing some of the flaws that for those of us who, who only coming to understand how the EB-5 project works are, are only now starting to realize. So thanks for your, your frankness and for your openness. And uh, if people want to know more, obviously it's all over Biz News. You, um, we, we are promoting uh, your, uh, well, exposing rather than promoting, exposing your company pretty well. But uh, otherwise, I guess you just uh, Google CMB regional centers and away you go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you can find us pretty easily. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we, we uh, are pretty active throughout the world and then active in South Africa as well. And as soon as travel opens back up, we'll look for the opportunity to get there. But if you want to get in touch with us, you know, as you're seeing here today, we're open to jumping on a, a video call or a conference call at any time. And uh, we can answer all of your questions and walk you through your path. And, and another cool thing about CMB is, you know, you're going to have access to people like myself, you know, our, our entire management team, frankly. Um, and we're going to assign a unique investor case manager who's going to work with you, be able to answer your questions throughout this process. We're a big team. We're a big company from that regard. And I think that's a, a service that we love to be able to provide to our clients. So um, Alec, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank, thank you to the uh, entire business team. This has really been fantastic. Well, it's been uh, fascinating for me too. Much appreciated. And and thanks for getting up so early in the morning. It's, uh, it's your regular time to wake up now at 5 a.m. Uh, yeah, maybe an afternoon, a little afternoon snooze might be in order yeah, today. You know, for a, a couple cups of coffee, I think, today. Is <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thanks again. Yes. And thanks to our members of the Biz News community. We will have the recording up on the uh, in the Biz channel or Biz TV channel uh, in the next couple of hours. So until the next time, cheerio. <laughs>